Thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is the first um, in the lecture series, the Inside Out lecture series, um, uh, this semester. And we are delighted to welcome Professor Craig Saper all the way from the US of A. And um, I wanted to do a treat for him. Uh, so this is my favorite book on Earth. Um, it's called Bartleby and Company by Enrique Villa Matas. And basically it's got 78 anecdotes of writers, poets, artists, who all refuse to make their work in one way or another. Some people refuse by killing themselves. I mean, it can't get that bad. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Um, anyway, um, there's 78 of them, but my favorite uh, is, is this one, um, number, uh, let's see, number, number 31. So I hope you'll enjoy it, I hope, and I hope Professor Sable will enjoy this. I, I saw Salinger on a bus on New York's Fifth Avenue. I saw him, I'm sure it was him. This happened three years ago when, just like now, I feigned depression and was granted sick leave for a long period. I took the liberty of spending a weekend in New York. I did, I did not stay longer because obviously I did not want to run the risk of being called by the office and of not being at home. I was only in New York for two and a half days, but it can be hardly said that I wasted the time because I saw Salinger, no less. It was him, I'm sure. He was the very image of the elderly gentleman photographed not long before pulling a shopping cart as he left a supermarket in New Hampshire. Jerome David Salinger. There he was on the other side of the bus. He blinked occasionally, otherwise I'd have thought he was a statue rather than a man. It was him, Jerome David Salinger, an indispensable name in any attempt to write the history of the art of no. Author of four books as impressive as they are famous, The Catcher in the Rye, 1951, Nine Stories, 1953, Franny and Zoe, 1961, and Raise High the Roof Beam, Carpenters and Seymour, an introduction, 1963. As I write, he has not published anything else, which is to say he has spent 36 years in strict silence, accompanied, what's more, by a legendary obsession for protecting his private life. I saw him on a Fifth Avenue bus. I saw him by chance. In fact, I saw him because I was staring at the girl at his side, whose mouth was open in a peculiar way. The girl was reading a cosmetic advertisement in the wall panel of the bus. Apparently, when the girl read, she relaxed slightly at the jaw. In that short moment, while the girl's mouth was open, lips were parted to use one of Salinger's expressions, she was probably the most fatal girl in all of Manhattan. I fell in love. I, a poor old hunchbacked Spaniard, with no hope of arousing the same response, fell in love. And though old and hunchbacked, I acted without a complex. I acted like any other man who finds himself suddenly in love. I mean, the first thing I did was look to see if she was with a man. And that's when I saw Salinger and was rooted to the spot, two emotions in under five seconds. Without expecting it, I was caught between the rush of love I felt for a stranger and the discovery, open to very few, that I was travelling with Salinger. I was caught between woman and literature, between the, one, the onset of love and the possibility of talking to Salinger and craftily finding out, as a world exclusive, why he had stopped publishing books and why he was hiding from the world. I had to choose between the girl and Salinger. Given that they were not talking, and so did not seem to know one another, I realised that I did not have long to make the choice. I had to move quickly. I decided that love should always take precedence over literature, and then I planned how I could approach the girl, bow before her and say in all sincerity, I beg your pardon, I like you very much, and I think your mouth is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. I also think as I stand before you hunchbacked and old, that I could, in spite of everything, make you very happy. Gosh, how I love you. Are you free tonight? <laughs> I was suddenly reminded of a story by Salinger, the heart of a broken story, in which someone on a bus on seeing the girl of his dreams planned a question almost identical to the one I had secretly formulated. And I remembered the name of the girl in Salinger's story, Shirley Lester. I decided that I would call my girl this for the time being, Shirley. I said to myself that undoubtedly having seen Salinger on the bus had influenced me so much that I had thought of asking this girl exactly what a boy planned to ask the girl of his dreams in a story by Salinger. What a mix-up, I thought. All of this is happening to you because you fell in love with Shirley, but also because you spotted her next to the elusive Salinger. I realised that to approach Shirley and tell her I loved her deeply and was nuts about her was a bad idea. Worse is what occurred to me afterwards. Fortunately, I did not decide to put it into practice. It occurred to me to approach Salinger and say to him, Gosh, how I love you, Salinger. Would you mind telling me why you have not published anything in so many years? Is there an essential reason why one should stop writing? Fortunately, I did not go to Salinger and ask him such a thing, but I have to confess I had an even worse idea. I considered going up to Shirley and saying to her, please don't understand, miss, my card. I live in Barcelona and I have a good job, though I'm off sick at the moment, which is how I've managed to travel to New York. May I telephone you this afternoon or in the very near future tonight, for example? I hope I don't sound too desperate. I suppose I am, really. 
In the end, I didn't dare go up to Shirley and say such a thing either. She would have told me to go jump in the lake. Somewhat difficult, since there are not many lakes on New York's Fifth Avenue. I then thought of using an old trick, going up to Shirley and asking her in my nearly perfect English, excuse me, but aren't you Wilma Pritchard? To which Shirley would have replied coldly, no. That's funny, I could have gone on. I was willing to swear you were Wilma Pritchard. Uh, you, you don't by any chance come from Seattle. No. Fortunately, I also realised in time that I wouldn't have got anywhere with that kind of line. Women know the trick of going up to them and pretending to confuse them with someone else by heart. They're quite familiar with the, by the way, miss, haven't we met before? And only make as if they're falling into the trap if they like you. That day in Fifth Avenue bus, there was little chance of Shirley liking me, since I was very hunchbacked and sweaty. My hair had been flattened and was stuck to my scalp, revealing an incipient baldness. My shirt had a horrible coffee stain, and I was not feeling at all sure of myself. For a moment, I thought that I stood to make a better impression on Salinger than on Shirley. I decided to go up to him and ask him, Mr. Salinger, I am an admirer of yours, but I haven't come to ask you why you have not published anything in over 30 years. What interests me is your opinion regarding the day Lord Chandos perceived that the endless cosmic whole of which we are part of could not be described in words. I wonder if you'd had the same notion, and that's why you stopped writing. In the end, I didn't go up and ask him all that either. He would have told me to go and jump in a Fifth Avenue lake. Then again, asking him for an autograph wasn't a brilliant idea either. Mr. Sanger, would you be so kind as to imprint your legendary sig signature on this scrap of paper? Gosh, how I admire you. I'm not Salinger, he would have answered. Not in vain had he protected his privacy with a will of iron for 33 years. Besides, I would also have felt terribly embarrassed. Of course, I could then have made the most of the situation to turn to Shirley and ask her to give me an autograph. She might have smiled and allowed me to strike up a conversation. The real reason I've asked you for your autograph, miss, is that I love you. I get pretty lonesome in New York and I can only think of stupid ways to try and engage with another human being. But it's very much true that I love you. It was love at first sight. Did you know that you're traveling next to the most reclusive writer in the world? My card. I am the most reclusive writer in the world, but so is the gentleman sitting next to you who has just refused to give me his autograph. I was desperate by now, and becoming increasingly drenched in sweat in the Fifth Avenue bus, when suddenly that I saw Salinger and Shirley knew one another. He gave her a peck on the cheek, while indicating that they needed to get off at the next stop. The two of them stood up together, talking quietly. Clearly, Shirley was Sal Salinger's love. Life is horrendous, I said to myself. But immediately I thought that nobody could change this. It was better not to waste time searching for adjectives to describe life. Seeing that they were making their way towards the rear exit door, I headed in the same direction. I did not like to dwell on mishaps. I always tried to turn setbacks to my advantage. I told myself that, in the absence of new novels or stories by Salinger, I could read what I heard of him say on the bus as a new literary instalment from the author. As I say, I know how to turn setbacks to my advantage. And I think the future readers of these notes without a text will thank me for it, since I like to imagine their delight when they discover that the pages of my notebook contain nothing less than a short, unpublished text by Salinger, the words I heard him say that day. I reached the rear exit door shortly after the couple had gone down the steps. I got off and strained my ears with a certain amount of emotion. After all, I was about to have access to unpublished material by a mythical writer. The key, I heard Salinger say. It's time I had it. Give it here. What, said Shirley? The key, Salinger repeated. It's time I had it. Give it here. Oh, gosh, said Shirley. I didn't dare tell you. I lost it. They paused next to the garbage bin. I stopped a few feet away and pretended to search in one of my jacket pockets for a packet of cigarettes. Suddenly, Salinger spread his arms wide and Shirley, sobbing, went towards them. Don't worry, he said. For Christ's sake, don't worry about it. They didn't move and I had to continue walking. I couldn't just stand there without saying a word and give away the fact that I was spying on them. I took a few steps and played with the idea that I was crossing a border, a kind of ambiguous, virtually invisible line where the ends of unpublished stories are hidden. Then I looked back to see how it was all progressing. They were leaning against the bin, holding each other tighter than before, the two of them crying now. I had the impression that Salinger, in between sobs, carried on repeating what I'd heard him say earlier. Don't worry, for Christ's sake, don't worry about it. I left them to it, I moved away. The problem with Salinger is that he has a certain tendency to repeat himself. <laughs> Today, our honoured guest speaker, Craig Saper, Professor of Language, Literacy and Culture from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, USA, faced a similar di dilemma, a fork in the road, as Robert Frost might have put it. And Professor Saper definitely took the one less travelled by. Not a tussle between meeting your literary hero or a pretty girl, but whether to keep his books or to destroy them. What he did so shocks me, I'm almost reluctant to repeat it. Almost. Encouraged by the Fluxus poet Ken Friedman, Craig sent his library at great expense through the US postal system to a company that chopped up his 1,300 <laughs> books, scanned every page, and returned his library to him on a USB stick. 
as a searchable database. This man is bibliocidal and should be approached with extreme caution. You have been warned. Please join me in sending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to the man without a library, Professor Craig Saper. Well, um, before I begin, I should tell you that I haven't actually gotten a USB stick, so the books are missing. Uh, and it's a true story, 1,300 books. I encourage you all to send your books away and get rid of them. Uh, before I begin, then, I want to thank uh, Simon Morris for that introduction and everyone involved in the Inside Out uh, speaker series, and also Patrick Wildgist. Uh, out at Shandy Hall. It's a real honor and, in fact, such a surprising honor that in my self-deprecating false modesty, but also in my real surprise at being called a poet in residence, I searched the invitation half expecting a typographical error, thinking that there must have been a mistake. Perhaps like in Terry Gilliam's Brazil, in which a literal bug gets into the system automatically substituting the name Tuttle with the name Buttle. Of course, unlike Mr. Buttle, the cobbler, who, because of the typo, is arrested with a receipt, tortured, and eventually killed by the government, my chance is hopefully more fortuitous. <clears throat> of course, the typo is a remnant of the printed word since the electronic versions are easily corrected, but the e-versions of newspapers, magazines, blogs, and other ephemeral publications have created a new opening, a new opportunity, a new chance. Now, since the typo is truly ephemeral, fleeting, and only there for an unknown reader, maybe no readers or readings at all, the typo doesn't get caught and has a life of its own beyond typographer, editor and author. Its animacy, its aliveness is only for you, gentle reader. And then quickly, no more, as maybe it is big enough to go viral. And then to be eventually corrected with apologies for the mistake. It is extinguished with an errata. This is my chance to talk about that fleeting moment of reading, the poetry or acrobatics of reading, the turning inside out of the reading of the printed page in contrast to the cognitive processes of literacy. I'm pausing now at the physiological processes of reading before interpretation, cognition, when the eyes dance across the page in a flourish, nevertheless reading. As Emile Javal demonstrated in the 19th century, when we read, our eyes jump three or four times a second along a line of printed text in a series of cicadas, rapid jerks, and fixations, momentary stabilities. Each second, about three to four fixations occur, and that is where true reading occurs, in brief pauses between cicadas, to make reading possible, we unconsciously block out the jumps and consciously only perceive a smooth continuum of thought and emotion conveyed by clear and transparent text. That trick of continuity, which makes literacy possible, also makes it difficult to even notice typos or other visual marks on our first read, our first glance. This is my chance. To read reading at the level of its actual unfolding depends on the double take, the stumble, on where it begins to break down into something like visual poetry. To have to read askew, sensitive to the visual surface rather than the literate meanings, otherwise you'll miss this type of poetry completely. 
There is a chance, my chance, a throw of the dice as in Mallarmé's poem, it is no longer the transcription of a meaning, as Philip Solaire's the poet writes, but quote, the spontaneous upheaval of the written surface, that what we are trying to read is quote, radical transformation of intelligibility itself, through as Barbara Johnson echoing Derrida writes, the ceaseless production of seemingly mutually exclusive readings of the same piece of language. <coughs> this is my chance. A chance reading that a one letter typo in my own surname has made my reputation and my invitation today by accident. For it is not uncommon for my last name to be confused by scholars and poets. With the last name of the famous <coughs> linguist Edward Sapir, with just one letter off, I'm asked by experts on reading comprehension, are you related? That similarity has provoked one poet to play on my name in relation to what he calls the Saper warp hypothesis. In fact, the visual poet and archivist Jeff Huff in a 2004 Visualizing Poetics po publication <coughs> included his saper Wharf hypothesis in the gl his glossary of definitions of poetic forms like refrigerator poetry and sand glyph, which precede the entire entry on saper Wharf and followed by semi-object and snow glyph. My entry is a poetic and elusive pun, Saper Warp Hypothesis, quote, the idea that a critic can make numerous factual mistakes about an artist's work, yet still succeed in making valid points about that artist's work. So my work is involved in mining the chance of the smudged, the typo, the mistake, as a form of automatic reading a poetry that only exists in the reading and often erased and effaced by subsequent editions, corrections, and printings. The Saper Warp hypothesis is a socio-poetry based on mistakes, expresses ideas in a distinctive style and combinatory rhythm that differs from reporting of the facts because where, for example, does the typo fit? It is expression without authorial intent, or even a singular phonetic corollary. It is a poetry that needs a reader without an author. It is the exceptional case that taken to its extreme conclusion suggests an unconscious or automatic reading poetry, a para-literacy perhaps, even preceding the phonemes and phonetic translation of marks on a page, the typo, makes visible the constructed nature of writing, serving as a transparent and limpid window on the world. The one letter difference between Sapir and Sapir is significant, but even the sapir Wharf hypothesis might be a mistake. Sapir and his student Wharf only had their hypothesis published posthumously, and neither ever referred to any hypothesis so it is a misnomer and mistake to begin with. The posthumously formulated hypothesis argues that the structure of language, the word choice, and grammatical structures available in different languages affect the speaker's thinking and organization of their world view. That is, language influences or determines thought or, and linguistic structures limit our categories in our world, and most famously, the saper Wharf hypothesis held that because, quote, the Eskimo language had many words for snow, they were able to distinguish and categorize the world differently than, say, English speakers who could add adjectives but had very limited terminology for types of snow. The English speakers saw it snowing outside and that's about it. 
the Saper-Whorf hypothesis could lead to other lists of words. Not for snow, but for the words and phrases used for weather frequent in other places and regions. Take rain, for example. The wet, squall, torrent, downpour, deluge, drizzle, mizzle, volley, nice weather for ducks, the heavens have opened, it's pattering, spluttering, trickling, it's chucking it down, raining stair rods and chair legs like a cow relieving itself, liquid sunshine raining upwards, it's getting biblical out there, it's siling down, it's plothering down, sea fret, it's mommy, and many more including hurly burly, or it's luttering down, or a real cow quaker, of course, we could go on and on, but that would be like bringing the mizzle to Leeds. Now, decades later, we know that the central premise of the hypothesis was based on a mistake and misunderstanding, not fact. There are multiple Eskimo Aleut languages, including Yupik and Inuit. All of them are what's called agglutinative. That is, they construct complex words out of smaller parts, like portmanteau words, like the huff neologisms, snow glyph. So as Jeffrey Pullum, a linguist at the University of Edinburgh, explains, quote, the list of snow referring roots to stick to them on isn't that long. Kwani for a snowflake, api for snow considered as stuff lying on the ground and covering things up, a root meaning slush, a root meaning blizzard, a root meaning drift, and a few others, roughly the same number of roots as in English. Because they can combine or agglutinate potentially millions or more combinations, the speakers of the non-existent Eskimo language discussed in the posthumous hypothesis but that never was formulated do have an infinite number of possible words for snow. But they also have similarly large or infinite numbers of words for rain, sunlight, fish, and everything else. Edinburgh's Pullum, quote, in the great Eskimo vocabulary hoax, in an obviously ironic quip, gets at the key point for us, quote, the persistent interestingness, interesting, interestingness, sorry about that, and symbolic usefulness overrides any lack of factuality, unquote. One could dismiss it, therefore, as a mistake if one were a scientist or linguist, which I am not, or marvel at its poetic resonance and interestingness as if our everyday language itself was an ulipo poem of infinite possible agglutinate montages of type, not type setting, but type unsettling. In fact, if you are smirking and glib reader today, my friends, then you might subtitle my own reading, The Great Saper Vocabulary Hoax, playing on the Great Eskimo Vocabulary Hoax, that you might suspect yourselves as shills in Saper's shim-sham parody of the academic talk on typography reading and literacy, all in the service of the mild reader noticing the disruption on the page. It is interesting to note that rain with its stray marks scattered in the visual image is the opposite of a clear day, and snow often a metaphor for disruption of the, imi of the video image. If every word spoken in New York City daily were somehow materialized as a snowflake, each day there would be a blizzard. A poetry based on a lineage that includes Apollinaire's collagram, Il Plug, that drizzles across the page, suggests the visual poetry both necessary for literacy and its spluttering disruption. Another speaker in this series, Natalie Cech, who showed her work here in the Inside Out series in January of 2017, 
produced a rare mix of this same Apollinaire calligram. It rains in commissioned collaborations with five writers in what might be thought of as readings. What is it about rain, reading, and poetry here in Leeds? Does the interesting poetic morsel mushroom up from the mizzle mistake? Although there never was a saper wharf hypothesis and the two never actually published together, if there was a hypothesis, then it was always already a saper warp hypothesis, for it is a name used to teach the fundamental foundations of structuralism, semiotics, as cultural codes, creating worldviews and determining thought. A compelling poetics built on a mistake. It is poetically interesting and spot on philosophically, if not factually accurate. It gets at a central issue of poetry and following from that profound insight were other linguists and poetry theorists. For today, in a type of poetic misunderstanding, a slip of the tongue, a typo, a blur, a smudge, an anacoluthon, those of you who know about grammar, an anacoluthon doesn't fit. I'm looking at the automatic poetry there is both in front of every reader, but, ob but oddly and almost impossibly, perhaps unavailable to a writer's conscious ego. A poetry of and through reading. A poetry of and through reading, not writing. The poetry of reading left effaced in plain sight. Following from the saper wharf hypothesis as the foundation of structural linguistics, a next major thinker was the Russian Roman Jakobson, who in his poetry of grammar and grammar of poetry explains that, quote, no nook or cranny, no activity, landscape or thought stands outside the pale of poetic subject matter. In other words, the issue of poetic subject matter has no validity today, unquote. Quote, the borderline dividing what is a work of poetry from what is not is less stable than the frontiers of the Chinese empire's territories. Novalis and Mallarmé regarded the alphabet as the greatest work of poetry. Russian poets have admired the poetic qualities of a wine list, an inventory of the czar's clothes, Gogol, a timetable, Pasternak, and even a laundry bill, Kruksnek. How many poets now claim that reportage is a more artistic genre than the novel or short story, unquote. And crucial for today's discussion, Jakobsen asks this, is it then possible to limit the range of poetic devices? Not in the least, Jakobsen answers. In fact, quote, the history of arts attests to their constant mutability nor does the intent of a device burden art with any strictures. We have only to recall, recall how often the Dadaists and Surrealists let happenstance write their poetry. We have only to realize what pleasure the great Russian poet Klebnikov derived from typographical errors. The typographical error, he once said, is often a first-rate artist. I need to repeat that line because it's so crucial to what I'm arguing here, which the typographers and writers and poets won't like, which I'll repeat. We have only to realize what pleasure derived from typographical errors. The typographical error, he once said, is often a first-rate artist. The typo itself is the artist, and that's just really remarkable to think. William Carlos Williams wrote, a poem can be made of anything. 
even typos and newspaper clippings. That is the challenge today, here, to announce a poetry of reading. The most important Russian futurist poet, Klebnikov, developed what his group called, quote, trans sense or trans rational language, known as ZOM. And ZOM sought to liberate sound from meaning. Inadvertently, perhaps, they also established the lineage for a typo poetry, a typo poetry that liberates visuality from meaning. As you'll see today that the possibilities of typos, mistakes, and misunderstandings is an opportunity for what we might call typo poetry. Through an automatic reading, the title of this presentation right now explicitly alludes to surrealist automatic writing. Unconscious automatic poetry hides in plain sight, revealed through the act of reading alone. Before literacy, even before our phonetic translation of letters and words, reading begins with a visual poetry. We do not notice this visual poetry in naturalized reading processes, but it pops out in machine reading, in typos, stray marks, censors bars, and editors' corrections, voice misrecognition, and in anything that foregrounds the visual poetry that proceeds, even as it makes possible, a type of meaning making. And that typo poetry functions, as Jakobsen notes, quote, to point out that the sign is not identical to the referent, unquote. What is the referent of the typo? The printer's mistake? The author's unconscious? The copy editor's absent-minded oversight? It points somewhere besides a window on the world or what the linguists call a referent. And in doing so, it functions as poetry, quote, as a revolt against the transparency of the world. Klebnikov is in this same concrete poetry lineage. Marjorie Perloff notes, quote, for the link between stagnation and sleep or between truth and divine wandering are precisely the links that intrigue poets, unquote. Or put another way, the stray mark on the page drifting away from the writer's control offers a poetic <coughs> opportunity. Perloff's placement of concrete poetry in a lineage seems uncannily to apply quite well to the emerging type or typo poetry. I'm announcing it today. Quote, the new poetics thus positions itself elsewhere as the destruction of syntax, Marinetti, and the word set free, Klebnikov. Klebnikov's poem translated here as incantation of laughter performs its title by agglutinating the one word stem, smek or smeyatsya, Russian for laughter or to laugh, to which prefixes and suffixes are added to generate new words without any external references or associations. So the poem becomes just the sound and visual shape of laughter. Start waking up now because I'm going to ask you to participate in a second here. Look at the O shape repeated much like in English. We might say, ho, 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 ho. One needs to literally laugh through this poem in Russian as a sound that leaves literacy behind. As a sound that leaves literacy behind. If there are Russian readers here today, anyone? Oh, darn. And uh, then we might here then recite a bit from the audience. Or anyone willing to read this transliteration? No. Or perhaps we can together do a reading of this very imperfect and mistaken translation. Half the room is, is we're going to try this out together, so bear with me and if you've taken your nap, now's the time to wake up and, uh, because you're going to participate here. It won't work unless everyone uh, reads it together uh, or tries to read it. So just start reading it aloud from the back. Just everyone. So like, I'll start. Oh, ha, laughter, laughing. So everyone try, try to actually read this. Everyone at the same time. Ready? Oh, 
Thank you. Um, the reading of our incantation of laughter reminds us of the innovative British visual and sound poet Bob Cobbing, who was also the publisher of Writers Forum. And anyone know Bob Cobbing? Just, just the, the usual suspects. Anyway, check his work out online. Amazing. Um, and it's not too dissimilar to what you've just experienced here. So now you're all sound poets. Um, anyway, Bob Cobbing, uh, who was a publisher and was a, an essential part of the love, London avant-garde poetry scene in the 1960s, when he, when he managed better books and staged many experimental literary and artistic happenings. In Cobbing's some statements on sound poetry, he explained that, quote, gone is the word as word, though the word may still be used as sound or shape. Poetry now resides in other elements, unquote. Even as we've seen as we were laughing, and how many of you, all too, only stick to the script? Because <laughs> it, it is an incantation. Once your mouth is in a certain shape and you're making these sounds, we could do it again later. Maybe just <laughs> throw the rest out and just do this. Um, but as we've seen, uh, the, the, the typography of the sound poem is an incantation of a reader's response without sinking down into the complacency of literacy. There is reading going on, but a sensual, visceral, gut reaction, rather than a school teacher's notion of reading comprehension. The X and O, in particular, often used as indicators of redaction or editorial interventions, have played a role in poetry since Edgar Allan Poe, and, and, it, I, and, I, and, and a long time ago, at the beginning of my career, I edited a uh, volume of visible language um, that included an alphabet on visual poetry with one entry on the letter X marks the spot that begins by explaining that quote the structure of writing is the structure of crime and its detection a deed is committed followed by a delay a reader appears to decode the mysterious marks left behind as a memento mori Hence, the inevitable association of the letter X with the mystery story. As the simplest letter to make, the mark of the child or the illiterate, it stands for all the others. More importantly, as the universal mark of cancellation, it represents alphabetic culture's murder of the author and the resulting liberation of his words. One of Poe's strangest stories, Xing a paragraph, and it should be required for anyone studying typography, implies a literal version of death by the letter X. Engaged in a competitive newspaper war, an editor is accused by his rival of excessive reliance on the letter O. He takes the bait and composes a long editorial using as many O's as possible. So ho, John, told you so, you know. Go home to your woods, old owl, go. You won't? Oh, poo poo, John. Don't do so, you've got to go, you know. Running out of O's, the typesetter makes the customary substitution for missing letters. And then, well, can somebody read this? Uh, how do you read that? And that's, uh, uh, any? In, in any case, um, you, you, it's mm, a challenge to read it aloud because it's a typographer, uh, it's a visual uh, poem, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in that. The next morning, the town erupts in a furor, but the editorial's author, without explanation, has vanished, never to be seen again. 
and Poe's short story about Xing a paragraph leads me to the typos in the paper of record in the United States, the New York Times. And I chose to read the Times for typos because in the States, it is called the paper of record because it is the most reliably trusted newspaper by historians and the general public or was until the recent tweet storms by our self-described great leader. Also, the Times takes great care to catch and correct typos and mistakes. The issue, the issue corrections, retractions, and write self-deprecating essays about the mistakes that their proofreaders and editors missed. The typos I found while reading often do not exactly rise to the level of a mistake because it is rarely corrected publicly. These are not mistakes of fact, but a mark without connection to a reference or any real world meaning. Uh, it, did anyone, show of hands, how many people get this one? No, no one sees it? A uh, one, two, three. It, look in the, in the top, the, uh, do you see it? A uh, couple of people see it, just, uh, look in the right below the New York, where it says the New York Times. Uh, look at the. Uh, you see it now. The, the date is 1075. Uh, they didn't have the New York Times in 1075. These are not mistakes of fact. So only the readers, those that notice the typos, appreciate this expression without meaning. It is a pure poetry. Did you catch this one? The date in the headline was 900 years off. Sometimes the typo one day seems uncanny the next. It seems to have some emerging meaning, but one that is not quite sure of its significance. Show of hands again, this one. Yes? yes? Osaka will pay Serena. What? And, and this was the day before the match that was somewhat controversial. Unlike the Russian Cubo futurist poets like Klebnikov or the English poet Bob Cobbing, typo poetry has only a slight sound component. But it is usually only noticed when reading aloud to hear the disjunction like an echo in your ear. I mean, here I am, I'm telling you there's a typo here. I was gonna bring in some with no typos and then you'd be like, what? Uh, <laughs> instead of yielding to your eyes, because we saw at the beginning that the eye is purposefully trained to miss it. It was until today an invisible poetry. Until today, although perhaps widespread, as who can know how many readers, as poets, are catching, stumbling, and finding the typo poetry in reading. It's the largest poetry movement in the world. It is a poetry after or beyond what the structuralists call the death of the author. It is unpublishable. It has a lineage in visual poetry. It seems sometimes surreal with the typo suggesting an entire constellation of loaded meanings. Front page headlines are not immune. And this particularly poetic typo suggests a framing of the issue around policy involving rape, sexual harassment, and the difference between policy and legal actions. I mean, it was, it's just, the typo reads as poetry, a poetry only for readers, not for writers or typographers or editors, who by definition have all missed it. The typo has a mind of its own. It is an automatic echo from an unknown and certainly unconscious source. 
it is a fleeting, surreal, and quickly erased. Like the collective news unconscious mind, it is anxious about something. It is poetry unvocalized and produced only by the reader's gestalt. It is by chance and one notices only on the double take by reading somewhat askew, noticing the surface of the page, not jumping to the supposed intended meaning, but lingering over the processes of writing. Collective, involving groups of editors, copy editors, printers, layout, and also writers. None of them caught the poetry, none. Only the reader and the poetry of reading. It is unpublishable, and once noticed, it is like explaining a joke. It lacks surprise. So I try to relay my own delight in finding these, and I have thousands, and now start looking at, you'll see there's typos just everywhere, but to explain it, it's gone. It only is in that moment the typo fleeting and invisible to writers, publishers, and editors, it is the poetry of reading. In the Capitol on Monday, Mr. McCain's desk on the Senate floor was draped in black and topped with a vase on white roses. And verse of chance, not as composition, but for a reader reading, tripping, it has no definitive singular meaning. It is simply a vase on white roses, the essence of surrealism. So that is my chance reading. And in honor of my lucky stay at Chandy Hall as the poet in residence, a lucky chance because the typo did all of the poetry and I did nothing. And me, just the reader, I'll mention here the entire organizing constraint of my reading poetry project. It is based on another reader's reading. This other reading reader was prisoner number 57,709. His name was Fred L. Stockford, a clerk and traveling salesman who at age 35 entered the infamous Sing Sing prison on January 27th, 1908. After being convicted of, quote, depositing obscene matter in US mails, unquote, and who wrote thousands of book reviews of all the books in the prison library. Thousands of book reviews. Here is the one I use to guide my talk on typo poetry. Trifle too much padding in this and too much beating around the bush, but in spite of that, this Tristram's uncle and father are the gamest pairs of argue fires that ever came down the highway. You've got to read it twice to get to the colonel, but it's worth it. So once I had found this unbelievable reader, I highly recommend his works. It took years for them to figure out who it was, but uh, I highly recommend his book reviews. He's the, he's the greatest. Um, the first step is, quote, you've got to read it twice to get to the kernel, but it's worth it. The next step in this reading poetry or the poetry that appears only in the process of reading is what we can call text shop experiments. And in fact, my former graduate students started an online journal with that name. I recommend you all publish your own experiments in reading there. It's called Text Shop Experiments. You can find it online, and they publish a lot of students that are doing these kinds of experiments. I'm going to take a drink of water. There's obviously an obvious allusion to Photoshop applied not to photographic images, but to texts, and specifically to reading or processing texts through a procedural method. William S. Burroughs, 
in the invisible generation seemingly describes a poetry of reading by taking any text taking any text, speed it up, slow it down, run it backwards, inch it, and you will hear words that were not in the original recording, new words made by the machine. Different people will scan out different words, of course. But some of the words are quite clearly there, and anyone can hear them, words which were not in the original tape but which are in many cases relevant to the original text, as if the words themselves had been interrogated and forced to reveal their hidden meanings." Unquote. Borrowing from William Burroughs' discussion of adding speed and movement to text, my poetry interrogates the supposedly natural connection between voice and reading or decoding texts. And the analogy that I use is hip-hop DJs. They discovered this method long ago, and I'm proposing the same for reading. That is, we've got to learn how, here is my two-minute example then, an explanation of a scratch reading tech shop experiment. It was done at O Miami. Natural reading primers. A blue. a blue and a ball in her natural reading primer, Ball 1906, presumes a one-to-one -one correspondence between word and line drawing, a strict delineation between the alphabetic and the image, and the innateness of these relationships at the foundation of natural reading. Shout out, we now think of remix and scratching records on turntables as a form of music. But it begins if as a form of reading, wrote this primer. What does that change? How does that change? My poetry of reading uses scratching a turntable as technique. A process of reading, a reading machinicity, had already long ago undergone a transformation using scratch techniques, allowing for variations of eye scanning beyond the But it begins as a form of reading. Quickly glossing the scratch process, the scratching of wide specific scope, scope of development, space, the highlight, the analogy between listening and Let's reading. Let's begin as we began with or the image sedimentation. To tourists and outsiders, the most famous DJ monument in the first Scratching a turntable is technique to produces a distinctive sound. The geodesic sphere in the epic of scratching. While the castle in the magic kingdom represents the entire, entire brand, brand, and you notice that the silhouette of, of the castle as a brand 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 logo is both a more general, general and not specific. We wanted to find a way to extend those This monumentation literalizes a narrative simultaneously the manipulating the crossfader of a, on a DJ mixer. Rhetoric and communication, or more precisely, Teaching composition as an experiment in our future of e-media. What does it mean to apply the type of processing of images and, and sounds has come to define the remix culture? Scenes and objects here in sections, almost all about the secondary literature on reading and literacy focuses on the process it fully articulates the implications that you into system. To appreciate reading outside of literacy, you out and into a place to send yourself by shifting videos of the Card, the frame of how one defines reading. The process uh, now resembles composition from growth. the future. Show postcard from <laughs> the future. Show postcard from the future. Show postcard from the future. A uh, video post. We now think of remix and scratching records on turntables as a form of music only but it begins as a form of reading. My poetry of reading uses scratching, a turntable technique to produce a distinctive sound and also the distinctive look to these texts by moving a simulation of a vinyl record back and forth on a turntable while simultaneously manipulating the crossfader on a DJ mixer. This type of processing images and sounds has come to define the remix culture, to appreciate reading outside of literacy we need to run an experiment. There is a risk here 
with all the concern about literacy, and, it's and it is heretical to suggest learning to read using scratch effects, learning to untangle reading from its naturalization, and a parodic effect easily missed. What if someone had built a scratch reading machine that changed reading into something besides the foundation of alphabetic print culture literacy? Here is my reading poetry with more in common with scratch remix than sounding out words. And the visual analogy of scratch reading as a type of typo poetry. Much scholarship has examined the strategies and impact of montage in sampling and remix. For various reasons, it is more difficult to talk about scratch effects on text because it concerns, quote, reading the illegible, a phrase coined by Craig Dworkin another speaker in this Inside Out series to describe visual poetry experiments. What if the mechanical processes of reading a reading machinicity had already long ago undergone a transformation using scratch techniques, allowing for variations of eye scanning beyond the concept, the confines of traditional literacy? Scratching is not an ornamental value distorting the text, but rather a crucial way of reading, uncovering the ghosts of meaning, lurking in plain sight. The turntablists are sometimes thought of as producing something to dance to, rather than a poetics or demonstrating how to read. What if instead of learning to read the natural way, one learned by scratching? What if those musicians spinning vinyl records were the future of literacy efforts? That is my chance. Suspended from the accident. And with that, my introduction to the physicality, the mechanics of reading as poetry. Concludes with one last reading. <coughs> the censor's reading. Why let someone else censor us, redact our texts? Let's all do it ourselves, beforehand, redact your school papers. Or better, as your reading hand in the redacted poem back to your, hand your reading back to the teacher with your redactions in it. Your professors, your editors, redact everything. Become the censors before they get to be the graphic visual poets of reading. It is a reading of a graphic mark on the page, a postcard from the future, but one that exceeds viscerally, sensually, and visually the confines of reading comprehension. We know what it means, but it obscures the meaning. Here's how it might read if we simply redacted a selection of first lines of poetry. This is your reading that you hand in to the teacher the instructors, the examining committee, when they ask for your reading of poetry, or your understanding and comprehension of the invisible style of typesetting and typographical design. I'll just read a few lines from this poem. I'll read toward the bottom here. Oh my, and I'm not sure what the blank sound should be because obviously I'm arguing that it doesn't have it. Does anyone have any guesses? What, how would you, how would you, what's the sound that the censor's bar makes when you're reading? A beep. A beep. Beep. Maybe people could beep it out. I'll try too, but, uh, so I'll read from, uh, my beep leaps up when I behold, oh, my beeps like a red, red rose. Oh me, what beep? Half love put in my head. Oh, say, what is that thing called beep? Poor beep, the center of my sinful beep. Since there's no beep, come let us kiss and part. She came, she is gone, we have beep. The beep was grassy, wild, and bare. The 20th beep is well nigh past. The beep is too much with us, late and soon, though others may her beep to a beep on turning her up, etc. To him in the love of beep holds 
In closing, then, I dedicate this talk to who, in the love of beep, holds your readers beep in their hand. Thank you, and good afternoon. <laughs>